Welcome to Independent Thought and Freedom. This week, we will be discussing Russia phobia, the new Cold War. It's incredible to witness. I remember when everyone laughed at Mitt Romney, rightly so, for saying Russia was the biggest threat to the US in his 2012 debates with Barack Obama. Obama quipped, the 1980s called and they want their foreign policy back. The Democrats ridiculed the Republican candidate for thinking Russia was a foe. Obama and Medvedev even exchanged friendly secrets accidentally caught on a hot mic. But now, Putin is one of the most hated and demonized persons in the world. Surely, we can all point to the US Democrats' desperation trying to explain Hillary's loss to Trump in 2016. But for this conspiracy theory to have taken such a deep and wide hold in American and more broadly Western society, demonstrates that there is something much deeper that they're tapping into. What does this mean for international relations now? Global peace? Global war? Is Russia an aggressive world power seeking to undermine democracies as the cartoonish Western press seems to indicate? What is the basis of the hostility? To explore this question, I am honored to have Andrei Raevsky, who blogs as The Saker, as my guest. I could not have a more qualified and insightful person to speak to on this issue. The Saker is a military analyst with a very important website, The Vineyard of the Saker. He is one of the most important and respected analysts in the alternative media, and his articles are featured on a wide number of sites. His website reportedly got 50,000 page views per day from August to September 2014. I'm very fortunate to have him on this show to help us understand the so-called Russia question. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Yes, I, I, I know you've been experiencing some health issues and I hope you're feeling much better. I am indeed, thank you. Good, well, thanks for taking the time to speak on the podcast. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I wanted to start off by, um, I guess, asking a little sort of personal question in a sense about your background. You're a Russian American, is that correct? No, not quite. Uh, I am a pure product of the Cold War, if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in Switzerland in a family of Russian refugees who had left Russia after the Civil War. So that would make me a fourth generation Russian. Uh, I never had a Soviet or Russian passport and nobody in my family ever had. So our, our family roots go back to Imperial Russia, if you want. Uh, but I did study in the United States and I lived in this country for over 20 years now. Right, okay, okay. So you, you migrated to the States as a student, is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I lived most of my life in Switzerland and then I moved to the United States and I got two degrees here in US colleges before moving back to Switzerland for a while where I worked in different places, including uh, the UN and the Swiss military. And uh, then I came back here to the United States. Right. Were you, um, the information that you could find on the web says that you were a NATO analyst, is that correct? Absolutely false. I never had uh, any uh, country. I never worked for NATO. Uh, no, I was an analyst for the Swiss uh, intelligence service. Okay. Of the, Sw the Swiss military intelligence service, where I worked as an analyst, um, and I never worked for any NATO structure. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't sure about the extent of, of your um, American background or, or even your Russian background as well. Um, and uh, I, I mean, one thing about uh, the Russians in America, you, you don't hear much. I think the biggest thing that, that hit popular culture was probably the deer hunter, right? Uh, if, if you know that film, you know the yeah, film? Yeah, I do know it. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, that was, and uh, it, when I saw it, that, that struck me about, um, particularly, you know, about the, the role of the Orthodox Church in, in the Russian-American um, uh, diaspora, I suppose, you know, and, and that, that was really interesting, but I don't think I've really seen anything else in terms of, of you know, the uh, Russian diaspora in, in America. Are there many Russians in America? Yes, very, very much. And um, there are many because they, they're completely different. I mean, we, we speak of waves. 
So there was this first wave, which was the Civil War wave, which uh, I am a descendant of. Right. Then there's the second wave during World War II. Many, many, many Russians uh, were either deported or fled or by whatever reason ended up being in the United States. Then there is a third wave, which was the Soviet uh, Jews. Um, and in Russia, really, Jew is more than a religion. It's a nationality. Yeah. So they were quite distinct from, uh, say, non-Jewish Russians. Right. And that was the big wave uh, of Russian Jews. And then there was a fourth wave, uh, which was the huge brain drain that happened in the 90s. Right. Uh, when, uh, when basically Russia was almost finished. I mean, it, uh, I think Russia was at, uh, at an edge of total and complete collapse. That's right. Um, so a lot of people immigrated. And then there's another wave now. And that fourth wave was a mix of Jews and non-Jews. And then there's another wave. Uh, there's the mobsters. <laughs> Yeah, it basically came during the pretty much at the same time, during mm -hmm. the, the third wave and and part of the fourth wave. The fourth wave was mostly people with uh, high uh, academic or scientific credentials. I mean, Silicon Valley is is full of them. Right. And you right. could say there's a fifth wave of Russians moving back and forth now between the U.S. and Russia. A lot of people yeah. have gone back. A lot of people have left. So there's more of a uh, so we see a circular or a yeah. two-way two immigration now. No, it's full of Russians. Yeah. And, 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 like San Francisco, New York, or Miami. It's, it's, there's a lot of Russians here. Yeah. So I mean, so in a sense, it's like in popular culture, they they've been underrepresented in a lot of ways, wouldn't you say? In American popular culture, because as I said, I can only point to the deer hunter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, but on the other hand, Russian Jews are another thing because. I think in the you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, ABC, CBS, and NBC, they were owned by three Russian Jews who were probably even related or from the same shtetl or something like that, if, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I wasn't aware of that, but uh, yeah. we all know the example of Google, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS in the 50s and 60s um, were were owned by by Russian Jews, yeah. Okay, and, and but this probably then that's my guess now. Yeah, we're probably talking about Jews who came to the United States before uh, or right after the the, the Soviet Revolution. I, I there was a big big immigration of Jews in the late nineteen early twentieth century, and then what is usually not known, people mostly now realize that a lot of Bolsheviks were Jews, but what they don't know is that a, a majority of Bolsheviks being Jews does not mean that a majority of Jews are Bolsheviks. Yes, yes. And a lot of Jews also fled, and some of the worst pogroms, for instance, in uh, the Ukraine were actually done by uh, Red Army units or by revolutionary units. Well, I mean... So there was also many Jews left in the, in the early years of the revolution. Yeah, and, I mean, and that's the other thing, that the Trotskyist element, mm -hmm. um, and Leon Trotsky himself, and the neocons, because yep. the neocons are now how pushing this war with Russia kind of have this old link to the mm -hmm. civil war and and uh, and Russia. So so there seems to be, you know, some historical memory or reckoning or unfinished business uh, occurring there. With, with, mm -hmm. You're touching on a, on a crucial element here because it is true that a lot of Jews who left uh, is still imperial Russia had a profound resentment against the imperial government, the Russian Orthodox Church, and a lot of them really didn't think too well of the Russian uh, non-Jewish people. And then, as you mentioned, it's absolutely crucial to understand that the Trotsky thing. Yeah. Because uh, to the extent that um, it is accurate that the early generation Bolsheviks were largely coming out of Jews, uh, Stalin changed that. Yeah, uh, but one crucial thing I want to explain here is some people say that Stalin was, you know, anti-Jewish. That's nonsense. What he did, he basically replaced uh, the dictatorship of the party by more of his own personal power and he switched cadres. Right. Because he did very different. You need one kind of cadre for you know a revolution and a completely different one to defend your country against a potential war, uh, which was brewing in in, uh, in Germany. So basically, and there was a purge of the party. Now, a party that's mostly Jewish, you can't purge it without hitting Jews. Yeah. Therefore, a lot of them indeed were uh, linked to uh, Trotsky and what he represented. And a lot of them also resented now the Soviet Russia for basically, as they would say it, repressing them. 
Yeah. Forgetting that they were the ones who were oppressed. The, the, the people who were repressed are, are the, the first generation of repressors. Yeah. And, and then to add another layer of complication onto the whole thing, um, at the, with the establishment of the state of Israel, Soviet Russia was a big, um, you know, was perhaps a, a premier ally, if, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On Absolutely. Stalin himself. Yeah. Well, remember that Israel originally was seen mostly as a secular and socialist country. Yeah. If you look at the early generation of of uh, kibbutz, of kibbutz, etc., these were people who were very, very pro-Soviet, really, and they were not uh, at all as anti-Soviet as as one might think, and their ideology was much more compatible with the Soviet official ideology. Yeah. Then the religious Zionist uh, racist ideology that came later, and then the way Israel dealt with its Arab neighbors, who were also allied for, for anti-colonial reasons to the Soviet Union, that added a layer of hostility. So yeah. basically, from being a pro-Israeli country, the Soviet Union became pretty rapidly the main supporter of Arab countries. Yeah, yeah, that, and that was about the, like around '73, I suppose, around the Arab and '67, I guess. All of it, yeah. Started, yeah. And so, I mean, and there's another aspect about, I, I, I want to just explore a little before we start, with, about the suppressed Russian-American relations. I think that's kind of the theme I'm starting off with. Is I, I remember also, no, I, I talked about Mick, Mitt Romney in my introduction, but Sarah Palin, they made fun of Sarah Palin too, when she talked about being in Alaska and being able to see Russia, and then mm-hmm. Saturday Night Live distorted it, and people think that's the reality, that she said she could see it from her house. But... Alaska used to be called Russian America. I th- mm-hmm. Most Americans don't even know that. It was Russian America. Until, so was a good chunk of California. Oh, I didn't realize about California as well. That was, Although, I, I should correct myself. Uh, Alaska was actually part of the Russian Empire, whereas this is in, in California. This was never Russian territory, but Russians were present there. Right, yeah. But as far as I remember, uh, maybe I'm off here and i'm glad to be corrected if i'm wrong but i think i'm pretty sure that uh, russia never claimed any territory in the state of alaska itself I, only a presence of traders uh, if i if i'm not mistaken i i believe i i have maps of alaska being called russia america yeah. and i be, i believe that the purchase was around the time of the louisiana purchase i think um, if when, i remember when, correctly yes yeah when they purchased um russian america but but Russia had territory, had North America was part of its empire, you know. So I mean, so the all, all these things that um, uh, that you know that, that that people have suppressed about the about the relations, I, I just find it interesting. Um, you know, even uh, my understanding is that because of that, uh, North America or the Americas as a whole, in terms of Orthodox Christianity, falls under the Russian Orthodox authority. You know, how, um, for, for listeners who don't know, the way the Orthodox churches is that, you know, you have your Serbian, Greek, your Greek Orthodox, your Syrian, your Armenian, and it's not theological splits. These are administrative uh, national splits. And from my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, from my understanding, the Americas really are supposed to fall under the Russian Orthodox Church. Are you aware of that? Well, it's somewhat more complicated and more controversial. Uh, initially, you're right. For instance, you look at uh, you know, St. Hiram of Alaska and other saints who came, uh, um, one of the major Russian saints of the 20th century, St. Tikhon, who was a patriarch after that, wasn't as a missionary in the United States. But um, U.S. is really a unique case because we're talking about a country of immigrants. Mm-hmm. Normally, the Orthodox Church, by the way, the Orthodox Church condemns the uh, separation based on nationality. It's actually a, considered a heresy uh, called philatism uh, that, you know, you should, you're not supposed to say every single individual ethnic or national group has the right to have its own church. But it is true that historically, the churches correspond to specific administrative or political uh, borders. But in the case of the U.S., it's fundamentally different because it's a country primarily of immigrants. Mm -hmm. So the Greeks brought their own clergy with them. The Russians brought their clergy with them. And so did everybody else. Right. So for a while, it's true that the predominant Russian Orthodox Church uh, was 
uh, a Russian Orthodox Church in exile, actually, in the United States. It was exiles of the first, first same first emigration. Oh, okay, right. Uh, but eventually, a uh, movement split off, said that they wanted to have a purely American Orthodox Church. Right. And there's nothing wrong with the concept, by the way. I mean, the way they went about it is a different topic. But the concept, fundamentally, is, is a sound one. Yeah. First, there shouldn't be two bishops in the same diocese. Yes. And we have a situation where we can have three or four bishops. In right. the same Armenian, diocese. Greek, exactly. Russian. Yeah. Uh, so there was an attempt to create, and it exists today still, something called the Orthodox Church of America, or OCA, which sees its mission as being the, the Orthodox Church of America and not an, an, an ethnically based one. And it's coming to that because the more the United States will uh, be a country of people, of local people, of, of people born in the United States and not freshly immigrants, the more the national division is going to not make sense. And for instance, in my parish, okay, I'm ethnically and culturally, I'm Russian. Uh, I belong to a nominally Greek parish mm -hmm. in which uh, our priest is Greek and we have some people of Greek origin and the rest are Anglos, Russians. It's a complete mix. Right. And that ethnic mix you see actually in most parishes, not in the United States. You see very often parishes are ethnically completely mixed, yeah. as it should be. Yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, that's what I suppose America is. It, it's, it's this immigrant melting pot. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and I, I sort of understood that too, in a way, because I, I'm, because St. Thomas, when he went to India and established uh, the church in Kerala, I believe that, uh, the Kerala church was brought under the authority of Syria. So that's why, um, in Kerala and in India, the, the, the old Christians there who, uh, would call themselves Syrian Christians. Um, even though they're not from Syria, it's because uh, mm -hmm. they were under. So, so I I sort of understood that um, sometimes, uh, you know, a, a bishop or, or an administrative center uh, might control a far flung region, and that because America was did not have a large Orthodox Christian population, that might have been the case. That then the Russian Orthodox Church would have been in charge. Or another uh, the, the situation where it's completely unplanned when. About a million and a half to two million people left uh, Russia after the Civil War. They just immigrated with their own priests, their own bishops, who did abroad what they did at home. They didn't change anything. They just continued. It was not some kind of fundamental decision, you know, uh, we're going to be running, uh, you know, Russian parishes in France or in Argentina or in the United States. It just happened that they emigrated. Right. And then local people, some regularly, there was a steady flow of converts which, of course, you know, brought the quote-unquote pureness of the Russian element down and added local people. And again, as it should be, there's nothing right. wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. So now, so when you, when you migrated to the States, uh, where, where were you? Um, I was in Washington, D.C. I was studying at uh, the American University first, and then at Johns Hopkins has a small school actually notorious for its neocons graduates. Yeah. Uh, and I, I actually have to admit, I got a degree at that school. <laughs> right, right. Um, right. So you're, you're blogging and you're writing on Russia. Um, so we're, okay, you were working with the Swiss, Swiss, Swiss intelligence, but not with NATO as such. Yes, uh, and, that, NATO and, that was, and that, uh, I think I've, I quit in 93 or 94, if I'm not mistaken in my, it was pretty yeah. much came to an end in 93, 94. So it has been uh, many years now. Right. So, so when did you start your blogging? Well, I started my blogging in 2007 in the United States. I came to the U.S. in 2002. And uh, basically, I had completely lost my career because of my political views. I, I was considered you know, politically unreliable and suspicious by, by first of all, the, the, the Swiss authorities and pretty much all the people of influence in that country. Well, do, do you want to elaborate on that a bit? I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> well, what I can say is that uh, two things happened, which were, to me, you have, I have to tell you this. I was a true bona fide, hardcore, uh, cold warrior and anti-Soviet activist. Okay. As, as hardcore as it gets, because I come from a family of white Russians. Right. And, so, and that's an interesting thing in the deer hunter, too, because the, the, the Russian Americans, too, they were... I mean, they were, they were so strong in their Orthodox faith, and so they hated the communists. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but things got really complicated in 91 because, the, first of all, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. 
But then Chechnya happened, and much closer to Switzerland, Croatia, Bosnia happened. Yeah. And uh, during those years, I mean, I was reading the Russian press, etc. I had always contacts in Russia, and I traveled to Russia the first time in my life in 91, uh, right after the coup, literally, before I couldn't go, for obvious reasons. And uh, I was absolutely horrified by the behavior of the West, uh, because I realized very fast that they were backing the Chechen Wahhabis to the hilt. And then I saw what was going on. Even worse was the situation with uh, Croatia and Bosnia. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you read the media and then you read classified reports, be it uh, sometimes maybe, you know, government documents. But also I was working at the UN and I was getting Unprofor documents every day. Unprofor being the name of the UN force that was supposed to keep the peace. Okay. In, and, uh, and just to be clear, so Switzerland is not part of NATO, correct? No. Officially not. Officially it's neutral. Right. So, so, so what does that mean in terms of its intelligence? Does it mean it gets both or it gets none or what? I, that is not something I can discuss. Sure, okay. Sure, sure. I, but what I can tell you is this. I can discuss, uh, it's called uh, partnerships. It's not something I'm not can discuss. Right. But what I can tell you is this. There was a generation of people when I, when I first got to, uh, to my position as an analyst, there was truly a generation of people who believed in Swiss neutrality, who were truly saying we stay out of that right that's changed before me i saw how pro nato elements were you know getting all the key positions how the other ones were either perched or leaving oh, some of the most brilliant people i met at the time left were happy to resign and you know i never forget there was one day we had a meeting of the entire general staff and one lecturer came in and said in swiss german uh Gentlemen, the new buzzword is interoperability with the NATO. You know, that was clear. So yeah. it's a fiction. The reality is today Switzerland is a puppet of NATO. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that obviously, I'm sorry, that obviously I couldn't, uh, I mean, I believed in free speech and being an honest analyst. I openly opposed that on grounds of Swiss neutrality. I also did not think that it was right for, for the West to support Wahhabis in Chechnya or to break up by force. Uh, Yugoslavia, and that got me very rapidly <laughs> blacklisted as a right. unreliable element. Okay. This, well, that, also, I traveled to the Soviet Union. Oh, sorry, to just after the fall of the Soviet Union to Russia, and I have to say, speaking with the people there, and including people who that are considered as opponents, such as party people, uh, KGB people, I met a lot of them spoke at length with them. And I have to say that also affected my, my, I realized that a lot of my perceptions were fundamentally erroneous. I still am not a communist. I still think that the fall of the communism in Russia was a good thing, but the price paid for it was horrendous. And the attitude of the West was an abomination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need, I, I'm, I'm intrigued about your observations on Swiss neutrality as well, because coming from, you know, a third world country, you know, the non-aligned movement defined, that's what the term third world meant. It didn't mean poverty, which is what people, it meant that you weren't with the West and you weren't with the Soviet bloc, you were supposed mm -hmm. to be neutral. And, uh, and certainly that, that fell apart too a, a long time. So it is, it's interesting about the parallels between, um, you know, the, the neutrality that, supposed, that was supposed to be there but uh, which, which fell apart for various reasons. So that, that's an interesting thing. So yeah, so, th so that's, that's, uh, that's fascinating. So, so when you went to the United States, were, were you involved in um, doing you know, military analyst work at, at all? Or, or uh, uh, My first degree was a bachelor's degree in what they called then Soviet studies. Right. And within that, I specialized, I met a wonderful professor a guy called Jackson Piotrov, who was of Polish origin, a brilliant man, a kind man, a wonderful man. And he gave me the virus of military, of, uh, um, military analysis. Right. And so I switched all my courses to as close possible to military topics as I could. And then when I went for my uh, master's degree, it was a double degree in international economics and strategic studies. That was almost practically purely military. Right. So my, my graduate degree is in military analysis. And uh, that became the passion of my life. And that's really what I think defines my, my education best. Right, right. And so, so your, your decision to, to start blogging, did, did that grow out of earlier independent work you were doing? Or, or what, what was, 
what prompted you to start your independent blogging? Well, what happened was is initially I was so completely disgusted with everything that I didn't blog at all. Um, right. As a matter of fact, when I came to the United States, I was homeschooling my children and my wife was a veterinarian and was feeding the entire family. Right. Uh, she couldn't work in Switzerland, but she could work in the U.S. where she got her uh, degrees because she's, uh, she was, she's like me. She's Russian fourth generation, but born in the United States. Hence, my, that I could get a green card very easily. And when we couldn't find any way to, to I couldn't find any employment. I should say, after I lost my um, original career, I retrained as a software engineer. Okay. And then, nine, and then 9-11 happened. And the entire, you know, software IT sector collapsed. At which point I was unemployed again, and I went like, this is too much. So I came to the United States and wanted nothing to do with my past. Right. But you know the French say, uh, chasser le naturel, il revient au galop, which means, you know, you try to suppress your natural inclinations yes. and they come right back. Yeah. And in 2007, I started blogging just because I wanted to scratch an itch. Right. I never tried to be uh, popular. I, n I made zero effort to get any kind of Google ranking or any kind of readership at all. Mm -hmm. I just began writing whatever went through my mind. And most of that was linked to the Middle East, actually. Right. I'm extremely interested in, uh, in the movement Hezbollah, which I studied for over a decade now. And I followed Israeli politics closely. So for me, that was the field of interest. And my blog wasn't really very popular because there was not much of a demand for that. What made it actually visible was the revolution in the Ukraine. Right. Because, I st because it was a coincidence, I was a person of Russian culture and, and worldview, but I was writing in English. And as soon as, as, as the trouble started, the entire Yevro Maidan and everything, I knew where this was headed. I said, this is headed for civil war. And I was right, and that actually got me a lot of uh, visibility. And since I'm considered now this Russian blogger who mainly deals with Russia, but really the origins were scratching an itch and dealing with Israel. Right, right, right. Well, that's fascinating, and and that that's that's an excellent, excellent background to, so for us to uh, get into the substance of of the analysis. But I, I, you know what, I I'm interested in in looking at things in a very broad historical point of view. I I, I think that everything in the modern world has roots that go centuries back, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly anything to do with Russia does. I I believe. Um, how, how would you say that, what, how are we to understand Russia in the broader view of the world, from your opinion? What, what is the place of Russia in the movement of world history? I, I don't know how far back you want to go, where you think is important to start, but uh, I'd be interested to know, where, where, where do you think the starting point should be for us in terms of understanding Russia's place in the world today? Well, in uh, theology, there's a concept called apophatic theology, which is negative theology, where you don't say what God is, but you say what he's not. And I will do kind of the same thing. I would say the most important thing to understand is Russia is not the Soviet Union. Yeah. Neither is it the Russian Empire. What Russia is today is what I sometimes call New Russia. Sometimes I refer to it as Putin's Russia. Um, of course, it grew out of the 80s and the 90s. I mean, there are links, obviously. But fundamentally, I think there's a qualitative break. The, the most important thing is that the, Russia is absolutely not seeking to be a world power or a second Soviet Union or some kind of anti-USA or any of that. Uh, as typically happens with countries who tremendously suffer from their imperial period, there comes a point where people don't want to hear about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And as much as Russians today want to have a strong country, they want to have a big and prosperous country, they don't think of themselves as small and irrelevant, there is no constituency for empire. That's why all the talk about you know, Russia invading Estonia or Poland or even driving to Portugal is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, as popular as Putin still is, if he tried something like that, there would be an instant reaction against that. And there was a reaction, even this very small Russian operation in Syria, which was very limited in size. Uh, Putin had to put a lot of his personal credibility to explain the rationale for it. And he had to go at length to explain, okay, this is not Czechoslovakia in 68. This is not Afghanistan. You know, this is not an imperial war. We're having a limited function in a case where it's our absolutely crucial national interest. And he tried to bring as many back as possible because the fact is Russia does no constituency for empire. How, That's the first thing. How, how, how did um, uh, Putin um, describe the national interest in Syria? 
Oh, very simple. He said, if we don't kill them there, we'll have to kill them here. Right. Remember that Russia had Chechnya. Yeah. And the, the, I don't think people in the West measured the true horror of what took place in Chechnya. Yeah. And to summarize it, I would say it's the same thing that hit Syria uh, when Al-Qaeda and the rest of them got there. Yeah, They were just as vicious, just as insane, just as animalistic, barbarian. I mean, we're talking about possessed people whose level of, of viciousness is just hard to describe and hard to imagine. Yeah, And every, the world saw that, you know, with all the executions that were uh, publicized mm -hmm. uh, in Syria. But what was going on in, in Chechnya was the same. It was exactly the same. Yeah, I, I remember that was like an issue that, that catapulted uh, Putin both domestically and in the world when he had to deal with that hostage situation in the school and when he dealt with it decisively um you know that that you know when he ended the chechnyan conflict in, in in other words more or less yes because in the school that wasn't an order that's a myth actually it was an explosion occurred and parents rushed in to save their kids and that's when the special forces rushed in to protect the parents and do their best and i think they took five or six dead which is unheard of for an anti-terrorist operation that was not planned at all they just i mean some of the special forces literally protected people with their bodies right so right. that was not planned but uh, yes he did uh decide he really did say this is intolerable and we have to stop what happened in chechnya yeah, yeah. and so for the russians you know that memory is still vivid Mm -hmm. And when they realize it's the same people, and actually his analysis is true, if they had taken over Syria, Iran would be next and Russia would be next. That's right, because in Al-Qaeda, I, I can't remember one of the leaders, they call him the Russian, and he has this orange beard. I, I can't remember his name now. But yeah. And, uh, oh, there are many. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I'll tell you, for me, I started to understand this more. I, I was doing some research on the self accession um mm -hmm. the issue with georgia and, and whatnot and uh, so i was writing a paper on it and as i started to read more and, and read the eu reports and and i realized um i just realized the lies the outright lies that the western media which even after the eu report exonerated uh, russia mm -hmm. and 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 uh, you know, showed how Sarkisvili and in, in Georgia, I mean, they were just cr crazy and, and they were trying to bring the West into a, con a confrontation and then, and then how that goes back to the, the, to the whole uh, NATO didn't disband after the Warsaw Pact disbanded and then started to encircle Russia and, um, and, and it, it was, and the whole, the, the NATO Russia Council, you know, disappeared and, and it, it was just a whole, you know, series of bad faith moves just Absolutely. constantly, constantly from the 90s, um, whether it be through, through Yeltsin, I, you know, was a tool in that case. And, and Putin was kind of like the, the spanner in the works, the spoke in the wheel. He stopped that whole planned disintegration process. And um, yes. yeah, and I, I, I realized that and from then I said, wow. Um, I, I really more understood what the dynamic was and how how propagandized people are in the West about this whole about this whole thing. Oh yeah, and keep in mind that, for instance, even after, uh, and I think it's really crucial to stress the the fundamental and crucial role played by Ramzan Kadyrov and his father Ahmad Haji Kadyrov, and the Chechens liberated their own country with Russian help, but they also played a crucial central role particularly in denouncing the kind of fake Islam that was, you know, peddled by the Saudis and, yeah. uh, and all the Al-Qaeda affiliates. But even after Kadyrov and uh, Putin managed to bring peace back to Chechnya, uh, Takfiri terrorism still continued in neighboring Dagestan. Right. And a lot of Muslims have been killed in Russia in defense of traditional Islam, killed by the Takfiris. Mm -hmm. So in Russia, there's an acute awareness uh, on one hand that not all Muslims are, you know, uh, yeah. Al-Qaeda types. Uh, for Russians, they're neighbors. That's you know, they right. lived with them centuries next. They know that they come in all sorts of flavor and colors like any other religion or group. And at the same time, there is this true loathing, hatred for, for the Al-Qaeda types. Yeah. The, and the program the there, yeah, the program there is very simple. We'll kill them all. I mean, that's, that's Putin's policy towards them. Either you stop or we'll kill you. 
Yeah. And he mm -hmm. said it very officially, he actually said it once using pretty crude language. He actually said once that he would off them off even if he finds them in restrooms, you know. Yeah. That was the kind of language he used. And a message was sent that we will crush you. And um, the Chechens themselves, when they speak of the Wahhabi types, they use the word shaitan, which means devils. Yes. You know, because they've, they, so it wasn't too hard a sell for him as soon as it was clear that Syria was about to fall to the same kind of people. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the end goal clearly was Iran and Russia. Yeah, because I mean, even in terms of, of understanding from the fall of the Soviet Union, I mean, you, you can tell me if, if I understand this correctly, if my understanding is, is accurate or not. But, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and, you know, the Warsaw Pact dissolved and NATO was supposed to be dissolved and it wasn't, and then you have the, the whole Bosnia and breakup of Yugoslavia, Kosovo issue. So you had all these betrayals, but Yeltsin basically del was delivering Russia to, you know, the neoliberals, the Western investors, the oligarchs. Uh, Russia descended from us, you know, within the space of a decade, you know, from a, a superpower to a, basically a third world country with life expectancy falling, the standard of living, deindustrialization, the, the crime, suicide, all sorts of things. It was just on a... a on, on an incredible nihilistic slide downward and looting. Yes. And, and Putin, when he came in, he, you know, and, and the Chechnya thing was sort of just, you know, just another piece of the, of the disintegration. And, and that, that was a strong issue that, that Putin could show that, that he was um, going to restore the dignity of, of Russia and that he would do whatever it took um, and that, you know, he, he turned the situation around when he fired, when, when he dealt with the oligarchs who owned the natural resources and they owned television stations and they ran political parties, you know, and, and some of them, I don't know how many, but I know some of them went to Israel to seek refuge so they couldn't be, um, prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you, you had all that cause that the link with the mafia is also has a very strong, um, Jewish link. Uh, yes. And the oligarchs and and the political parties and the media and and all these things and so 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 Putin was was this was this man who actually did turn Russia around restored its its dignity on the world stage and um, and that's really what I, I think you know the um, the Western media who are related to to a lot of these oligarchs. Um, uh, carry this resentment against Putin saying he's he's fighting down democracy and um, you know uh, against free market and and all, all all these ideological covers for defending their ethnic kinsmen but that that's my uh, understanding of, of the situation and the the genesis of the modern uh, problem, the contemporary problem. I, what do you think of, of that interpretation? I think it's a largely correct one. I would just say that besides uh, the Jewish Zionist link, uh, under Yeltsin, humongous resources were basically gifted to the West, uh, right. be it in terms of money or natural resources or precious metals, you name it. Yeah. One of the things that Putin did, uh, I should tell you, by the way, Putin ideologically is very much, and to my regret, a liberal, um, um, he's for liberal market and capitalism. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he did not install anything close to anything re resembling socialism. Mm -hmm. All he did is tell the oligarchs, okay, the big ones, stop intervening in politics or else. And everybody else who get the message, stop robbing the country blind. You still get to, you know, pocket millions, but not in a way that's going to destroy the nation. Yeah. So the, the, the flow, the outflow of resources was stopped, which was also another reason that got a lot of people angry. I mean, Bill Browder, I will name him, but there are other, uh, you know, this is a typical thing is that the West could plunder Russia for a decade. Yeah. Basically with the collaboration of the Russian government in place. Yeah. Putin put a stop to that. And that's that elicited hatred. And finally, I think what most elicited hatred from uh, from the West is that Putin was the first man to openly denounce, the first major head of state that openly denounced the Western ideology, behavior, hypocrisy, and imperialism. Yeah. 
And that, and that, you know, coming from Iran was bad enough. Yeah. But coming from a country populated by people who at least look European externally, I don't think Russians are culturally European, but geographically they certainly are. Uh, that's, an, that's a big problem. And Russia has never stopped. Mm -hmm. And even the Chinese who dwarf Russia, uh, uh, and the Chinese economy dwarfs Russia by any measure, they don't as openly, they, there's no equivalent of the, the speech that Putin gave to the UN a couple of years ago or the famous 2007 speech. Absolutely. In Munich. So Putin did, not only did he stop that outflow of resources, but he said no and overtly said no. You will not treat us as your subordinates and we reject your values. And yeah. that, I think, is even another major reason. Ab absolutely. And, and, and the fact that, I mean, because, because Russia has the military, you know, uh, resources and has devoted itself to that, it's, it's, Russia is explicitly playing a role in reshaping the international, global, political, military yeah. balance um, in a way that, that no other country is doing. And, um, and I mean, it's being projected in Western media as, as that is some sort of imperialism, when in fact, it's the exact opposite. Um, it, it, it's, it's about, you know, respecting sovereignty. And, sovereignty, and yes. It is about sovereignism, if I can say that. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, that Russia is the biggest because China does the same thing, but in a very different way. Yes. The Chinese use their own skills, their own assets, their own resources. Uh, but basically, they are building a separate economy in Asia. I mean, the, the, what, what, what Xi Jinping and Putin are doing is not at proactively bringing down the Western Anglo-Zionist empire. They're just building a parallel alternative and letting the empire collapse upon itself. Right. That is their strategy. And I, I think that one more aspect of Putin's, um, of, 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 I don't know if to call it Putinism, but, but certainly... I his, think we can speak of that, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, one aspect of that that we have to also put into the historical perspective that I think most people in the West have no idea about, and that is the idea of Moscow as the third Rome. I, I'd like you to elaborate on that uh, for me as well, because my understanding of it is that after the fall of Constantinople, um, then... I, I, I don't know if there was an intermediate stage, but R Moscow then became the sort of center for the Orthodox faith uh, in the world. And, and that's when the idea of the third Rome came about. Uh, if, I, if I get, if I have it wrong, could, could you please straighten me out <laughs> on my understanding there? No, no, you have it right. But I would say it's a very complex topic because uh, its roots are in specific. Uh, Christian eschatology, uh, specifically some um, writings of St. Paul. Uh, basically, I would say that the scripture says that there will always be something, who, somebody who will restrain, who will hold, who will prevent uh, evil from having free reign on the planet. Um, and the idea is that it's the Orthodox emperor. <coughs> So the first one, obviously, is the uh, when Rome was still, uh, you know, not Latin Christianity, but or the original Christianity of, of 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 the first centuries. Rome was the center of the orth. The Roman Empire was a Christian Orthodox Empire, if you want. Yeah. Uh, when Rome fell under the under the Franks and eventually uh, left completely, uh, both in terms of of dogma and in terms of even praxis of Christian traditions, uh, the logical uh, successor was indeed Constantinople. And when Constantinople fell uh, a thousand years after Rome fell, so there was a thousand years of Roman history that most people in the West are unaware of. Absolutely. And the people in Constantinople didn't call themselves Greeks, by the way. They called themselves Rum, Romans, right. mm -hmm. as opposed to the Frang, who are, you know, the Franks, the Latins. Yeah. Uh, when they were eventually taken over by the Ottoman Empire, that's when a number of people in Russia said, particularly one uh, author said that, you know, Moscow is the third Rome and there shall be no fourth. But I want to just add a caveat here. If we accept that theological um, interpretation, as I do, then you have to understand that Putin is not an Orthodox emperor. And uh, the prophecy says there shall be no fourth. So Moscow today cannot claim to be 
a third Rome because Mos modern Moscow has lost the continuity to the previous third Rome that Moscow was until 1917. The, right. Rome, the Orthodox emperor was murdered and there, there is no other uh, Orthodox emperor. Right. So a political leader does not qualify in this, in this quality of uh, the one who restrains. Right, right. So it is, it is an important culture. It's a very important topic, but I'm not sure that it's applicable. Some people do see it as applicable to modern mm -hmm. Russia. I think their theology is, shall we say, amateurish or shallow. Right. Yeah. But, but, uh, 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 but one thing I think people don't understand is how important Christianity was for the Russian people, yes. the Orthodox Church was for Russian identity itself, and the violence that the Soviet Union did to that in terms of the massacre of the Tsar and his family, of priests, of the church, and, and w which meant killing the Russian soul uh, under the Soviet Union, and, and it was hollowed out, and, and that the Soviet Union was not Russian at all, as Solzhenitsyn himself talked about, and then when and Putin and a part of Putin's project was not only about restoring the, the military or political um, uh, status of Russia, but its spiritual status and the role of the Orthodox Church in contemporary Russia and Russia being a, a Christian society, an explicitly Christian society. I don't think that's appreciated at all, and, and how important that is. Um, you know, people are thinking of Russia as communist totalitarian. Um, it, it, I, it, and it just really uh, shows how little they understand the situation. Uh, that's the way I understand it. Am I right? Well, I am a little bit more cautious here in the sense that I think that is part of the dynamic. But Russia is a moving project right now. It's a moving target. It's, it's, it's a project more. As of now, most Russians are not very religious. That's a fact. And it's okay. a fact that shouldn't be ignored. Right. Um, however, they're also not hostile and they're seeking their roots. They are trying to find a way back to what would be a traditional form of Russian Orthodoxy. Okay. It is made very difficult by the fact that they have this terrible gap of, of, of over seven decades of you know, militant atheism. Yes. And not helped by the fact that a lot of um, the current Russian Orthodox Church, sometimes called the Moscow Patriarchate, is a direct descendant of that faction of the church which agreed to collaborate with the Soviet regime. Uh, which doesn't mean that they're still doing it today, it just means that these people are of, uh, how shall I put it, flexible morality very often, at least uh, the bishops certainly are, at least the old generation. Um, and uh, they're trying to recreate something, but you mentioned Solzhenitsyn. I think his estimate was that it would take 200 years for Russia to recover right. from, from the devastating effects of, of the Soviet period. And I think it's true. So it is, it's headed there. It is a very important topic, yes. But I would not uh, say that Russia, as of now, is a country with profound Christian spirituality. Just turn on Russian TV and look at the advertisements you see there. It's okay. revolting. If you look at the kind of mercantile, you know, ugly thug capitalism that it still exists in many, many uh, segments of the Russian economy. Russia, Russia still has, you know, the people who are in power today, they were formed in the 80s or the 90s. Yeah. So Russia is suffering from tremendous internal problems, tremendous internal contradictions, and it's too early to call. I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm saying right now there are so many um, inherited problems and contradictions that it's too early to call it right right i, I want to bring the conversation to another topic that's um that's relevant to, to me particularly here i'm broadcasting from trinidad and tobago and we're just seven miles away from venezuela and we receive the most amount of venezuelan refugees per capita in the world um uh and we, we've had a long experience with venezuelan instability and uh, th this wave of, of migration is, is something else. And, and the whole um, coup process has divided the country in a lot of ways. N not in, I mean, w we're not going to get into civil war over it, but I mm -hmm. mean, but there, there are strong opinions as to what we should do. And although historically our position has been one of neutrality, let's say even towards Cuba, towards China and, and this sort of thing, um, 
that's kind of waned over the years and um and so people you know many people are just saying listen you cannot oppose the united states and so we should support guaido and but the the government uh, officially is staying neutral thank god for that um but now when the when the reports were that um the russian military were in cuba i'm sorry we're in venezuela and also that apparently some russian military planes landed in our airport en route to venezuela people were were like panicked because because there's this idea of of the russian bogey that that the you know that the russians are evil you know it's like james bond movies it's it's you know and and when i try to speak to my fellow citizens about this it, it's it, you know it it, it it it's like speaking to you know a, a wall they they just mm -hmm. it, they are just so indoctrinated by james bond movies and cnn and and all these things and that russia is evil and it, it made me think about um you know the idea of of russia's soft power um which it has you know, it, there's a real deficit there. Let me put it that way. Whereas, you know, uh, uh, America and Britain, you know, they, they have all their cultural things. And because we're an English speaking, a former British colony, therefore English speaking, we absorb all the English stuff and all their prejudices. Um, but certainly, you know, that, that's a big handicap that uh, Russia has because just the name Russia is, is equated with evil for people who, who, you know, I mean, they're not analysts. They're just normal people going about their business. They watch TV. They go to the movie. So I'm not going to blame them as such. But, you know, but there's this deficit of, of Russian soft power there. And, and I think that, uh, you know, that really affects its, its moves in places like Venezuela. What, what's your commentary on that? Well, first of all, I would say that, you know, for a while in my life, I read the Soviet press for a living as an analyst. And I am intimately familiar with what the super Soviet propaganda looked like, and it's nothing like in the West. It was much more honest, much more credible, much more interesting, much more diverse. I mean, it's a disgrace. The Western propaganda machine, first of all, is much more effective than, than, than the Soviet one. And secondly, it has been developed. See, keep in mind that, again, modern Russia, you can sort of say, began in, by, by 2000 when Putin came to power, just you know, after or before that a little bit. The Western propaganda machine has been developed at least since the beginning of the 20th century and very effectively. This tool has been honed to perfection. I mean, and, and, and the fact that most of your, uh, uh, you know, fellow Tobagons or Trinidadians think that Russians are James Bond and have all those cliches is a testimony to that. Mm -hmm. And what can Russia oppose, RT and Sputnik? Well, first of all, uh, they have much less access. Uh, secondly, I can tell you, for a fact that even on RT and Sputnik, there are all sorts of flavors and all sorts of people with different point of views. Yeah. Um, so it's not that simple. Uh, the main enemy in Russia is internal. It's a, it's, a, it's, a tra it's a traditional Russian curse. Russians are good at dealing with foreign enemies and they're terrible in dealing with their internal enemies. And these enemies are very real. There's a lot of people who hate Putin. There's a lot of people who would want things to go very differently and they have a lot of money and a lot of influence and they still sit in all the key positions so the people that are trying to create a counter narrative and develop uh, an original worldview and a and a, a program that you could show the world and say that what we stand for are him hindered by the people who prevent them from doing that and still today in russia the discussion is you know what are what are true russian values and people disagree so it's much harder for a country who's just come out of really, you know, been now 20 years, that's very short in the history of the country, who just came out of an apocalypse and almost died, to develop a counter propaganda machine as effective as the Western one is very uh, difficult and takes tremendous resources. Yeah. And I think RT did a very good job still, considering the resources and the time left, but look how they're freaking out everybody and they're being banned. Yeah. Because they can't tolerate RT. And I don't know if how it is in Trinidad, but here in the United States, if you go to a hotel and you look at the cable subscription in a hotel, RT is not going to be there. Yeah, yeah. It's just not going to be there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we do have it on our cable TV, but it's not, 
it's, it's, it's not looked at uh, very, very widely by people, but, but politically minded people will take a look at it. But you know what I think is important in, in terms of all of this, um, the BRICS, right? Now, that mm -hmm. is kind of a fallen apart a bit. It, it doesn't have the same momentum it had about 10 years ago. Although the Belt and Road Initiative, which has taken off from it, that has, has built on it. I, I think that uh, that that would be something important for for Russia to to have a um, a more leading role in um, as a partner with with developing countries like ourselves who are critical of the IMF of the World Bank of the development policies that have impoverished us and continue to impoverish us and that this new world order that's being built starting out of the BRICS and and developing into the Belt and Road Initiative, I, I really think that is, um, that's something that's very important that China has been taking the lead on. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, Russia's participated in it uh, very enthusiastically, but I, I don't see them uh, pushing it in the same way. Is, is it that, um, uh, why would you say that? Is, do, do, do they not see it in, in this, with the same strategic importance that perhaps I, I might see it in? Well, there, there are many things uh, overlapping uh, issues here. One of them is that in, in China, the entire business world, the business community, is basically subordinated to the state. The state gives them, they don't micromanage them, but they give them strategic goes and don't goes, do's and don't do's. So China has a much, first of all, it's a much bigger economic power. And secondly, it's a much more focused one. In Russia, the problem here, again, we're always coming back to the fifth, what's called sometimes fifth columnist, et cetera. If you look, for instance, at the Medvedev government, the entire so-called economic bloc, which are the main ministers dealing with economy, are all IMF World Bank types. All of them. You're not going to get from them what you're going to get out of the Chinese because their worldview is different. They don't want yeah. anything. They don't want any part of that. They will go for a quick buck, you know, but they will prevent Russia from fully acting on that. Yeah. Now, the other people that I, I refer to them as Eurasian sovereigns understand that very well. And truly, in spite of that economic block, Russia and China have made a, a, something quite unique in history. It's not a formal alliance, but it's essentially a symbiosis. Yep. Because China is crucially dependent on Russia for a number of things. First and foremost, energy and high tech, including military high tech. And the Chinese still are not even not even close to Russia in terms of, for instance, bu building engines, which is one of the most important things for for uh, military air power. You know, the engine is probably the most important part of of any military aircraft, and uh, the Russians can do it. The Chinese can't, and there are many other examples of that. So, what is happening now is China does most of the heavy lifting in terms of economy, in terms of markets, and all of that. Russia has this internal fight between the two groups who have different views on what should be going on. And Russia, where she can be strong, does help China. Yeah. And it's for arms sales, it's energy, and it's basically, if you want, it's, Russia will be the policeman that's gonna police the one, uh, one belt. Yeah. Because the security along that road depends on Russia. No other countries have the means, and you can bet that the only country that has enough military muscle and intelligence, et cetera, get a strategic power to protect that project is Russia. The Chinese know that very well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, it's, I, a, it's a symbiosis, really. I think the two are fundamentally dependent on each other. It's a very daring thing to do. It's never been done, to my knowledge, in the past. No formal alliance, two separate empires, no mutual obligations, but essentially symbiosis. Yeah. It's something very new. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it's really, re, it's reshaping the world. And um, I mean, Western propaganda, they are really trying to, to undermine it, to break it apart. I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, even though our government in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, has signed on to it, um, so many people are, you know, are skeptical a, a, about it. And, and um, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, um, e even though, you know, I, I keep trying to place it in the context that, you know, it's part of the whole process of us seeking a new international economic order since the 70s because, because the way this, the world system has been set up, it, it's, um, we will always be exploited in it. 
and this is a whole new paradigm. And um, but uh, I I really think that that uh, it's important uh, for 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 this. I guess it's coalescing. It's a great way to to yeah. bring all these strands together into one sort of uh, major project. Because what what's really happening? This is an amazing point in world history. It's really reorienting, you know, the pattern of the past 500 years. I mean, it's it's an entirely new system that's emerging in the world. Yeah, do you agree? Yes, and it, yes, very much so. And the way it goes about it is amazing. I mean, you have the Islamic Republic of Iran, the officially communist China, and liberal capitalist Russia actually totally agreeing with each other and working together um, with a clear understanding that there is no single model. Yeah. I mean, that, the advantage of that model is it's, it says that every country has its own historical development and relations between countries should be ruled by international law where all countries are basically completely sovereign. So the fact that neither Russia or China attempts to create satellites, for instance, is very typical gives them tremendous flexibility because it gives all other countries the option to choose and pick what they want and to participate only if it's in their interest rather yeah. than being pressured by some bully who tells you if you don't do what i say i'm gonna bomb you that's right yeah i i, I think it's, it's such an important project that still needs articulation um it, it's there all the pieces are there everything is there but but i don't think it's been ideologically pieced together as yet and I, I think when it does, it, it, it will be a, a, extremely powerful. This is epoch-changing stuff. That, that's what it is. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, I, I know uh, we've been talking a while, so and I can keep you here for hours, but, but l let me try to bring our conversation to, to a close. I mean, you write so prolifically on so many topics, but in sum, what would you say is your main message that, you want to put out to the world? Oh, if it had to be a simple one, imperialism, imperialism does not work. Right. Simply, right. the people who get hurt are the host countries of the empire. Right. And it's time that this, I, these ideas, you know, be ditched. Because really, we've tried it many, many times under various ideologies in different countries, and at every time it ends up in disaster and violence and poverty. Right, right. So I think this would be the core. And and I mean, you you've been you know you you've spoken about your you know your sort of opposition to imperialism and and evil in, in the world. And what what really gives you your your strength and your inspiration for that? Because I mean, you know, do, doing what you've done, you know, you've been blacklisted, you've lost your employment, and you know, and you know, a lot of people that would defeat them, but but you overcame that and what and i think that's important for people to understand what gives you that personal strength to overcome those challenges oh definitely definitely my faith right the fact that i accept i know that i have to accept the will of god that i cannot control things you know i, I like to say that christ never told us to achieve an outcome all his instructions were activity oriented do this do that don't not achieve this or achieve that so for a, for a real Christian, victory or defeat is irrelevant. What matters is resistance. And that's a very different point of view. You know, I will be defeated. That's okay. But I will not give in. All right, right. Excellent. So what would you recommend to a young person listening to this podcast? Are we talking about somebody in an English-speaking world? Well, yeah, generally. But, but, but you can, right. if you want to have two different messages. Expose yourself to as, first of all, get rid of your TV. Throw it out of the, it, it, you can make a celebration out of it. Instead of making it just a little thing, invite your friends. Put the TV in, the, in your garden. If you have a lot, right to a firearm, shoot it, then burn it, then have a party. Get rid of your TV. Completely sever your connection to the corporate media is the very first thing I would recommend. Secondly, get proactive and start making your own list of information sources you trust over time you will know which ones are better which ones are worst and build your own information and absolutely go beyond your country try to expose yourself learn as many languages as you can expose yourself to as much 
other thinking uh, as you can, and crucially, always listen to your enemies. They might not be enemies, or they might learn, you might learn something interesting from them. So if somebody is blacklisted or you're told it's a bad guy, don't go there, go there. This would be my advice. Right. Well, I know you're, you're so prolific. You, you have your books, you have your, pod, you, you have your blogs and so forth. Do you have any specific plans for the next you know, year, five years from now? Any projects right. you're working on? Uh, well, my main, uh, I was invited to visit your beautiful country. And I hope to be there in December. Sheikh Ibrahim has invited me, and that's a true joy for me. I love the man. And uh, I didn't see much of Trinidad, but what I saw of Tobago, just, I mean, he always speaks about my, my cherished uh, Tobago. I have to say, this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. And the people were absolutely wonderful. I have a beautiful, uh, you know, recollection of my first trip there, and I tremendously look forward to repeating that. And other than that, I will have a book. My third book will be coming out this year. Excellent, excellent. Well, I look forward to that. And I look forward to seeing you in Trinidad. I'm going to be interviewing you at the event. It'll be two days before my birthday. So oh, it, will be, it won't be mine, but it will be better than a birthday present for me. Good, good. All right, well, I want to thank you so much, not only for this interview, but for all the work you've done over the years. You're performing a very important service by countering the warmongering agenda and doing your part to stop the American neocon drive to war. I urge all my listeners to subscribe to your email list, read your columns, visit your website regularly. It's really a treasure trove of essential information that you won't find in the mainstream media. I admire your hard work, the sharing of your unique insights, your dedication and your determination, and I wish you continued success now and for many more years to come. Thanks. I wish you the same. And thank you so much for all your kind words. I will strive to deserve them. Thank you. That's all for Independent Thought and Freedom this week. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, make sure you subscribe, leave me a rating, like, and share this podcast with your friends. Thanks, and bye for now. <laughs>